Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our newest and latest and greatest vodcast. And this is going to be a several parter on GI bleeding. And let me go through some of the very basic things with you. We're going to look at some of the background data. We're going to look at how we do the studies. We're going to look where the studies um, really are most efficient, some of the challenges, some of the pearls, and some of the pitfalls. So from background data, acute GI bleeding is a common medical emergency. Up to 2% of all medical admissions, 20 to 27 cases out of 100,000 for lower GI bleeding, and up to 150 for upper GI bleeding. So upper GI bleeding, as we all know, is more common. Patient's mortality is as high as 40% in a patient with hemodynamic instability. Now, one of the things that's always a challenge with GI bleeding is about 75% of the cases see spontaneously and bleeding recurs in about 25% of cases. So it's always been frustrating. You start working the patient up, you find nothing. And is it you didn't find the pathology or it just stopped bleeding? So it's always a challenge. Now we talk about upper GI bleeding, which is defined as bleeding proximal to the ligament of trites, and lower GI bleeding beyond the ligament of trites. And lower GI bleeding is the one really where CTA is most valuable. It's looking for blood coming from the small bowel or for the colon. The term suspected small bowel bleeding is used when the upper and lower GI tracts have been evaluated and no bleeding site has been identified. There's also the term obscure GI bleeding is when no bleeding source is found after the entire GI tract has been examined with advanced techniques. And as we said, sometimes when you have bleeding, bleeding will stop and you just don't find the source of bleeding. Sometimes it'll recur later and you find it, and sometimes it just won't recur at all. So here we go, background. Upper GI bleeding proximal to ligament of trites, classic hematemesis, coffee ground vomiting, or melena. And lower GI bleeding, which is distal to the ligament of trites, melena, hematochesia, positive fecal occult blood test, or visible rectal bleeding. Now, when you talk about upper GI bleeding, it's the things you expect. Gastric ulcers, duodenal ulcers, varices in patients with cirrhosis, erosive gastritis or duodenitis, the occasional Mallory Weiss tears, and of course, malignancies. Lower GI bleeding, typically diverticulosis and diverticulitis, angiodysplasias, colitis, malignancies, be they of the uh, small bowel or the large bowel, anal rectal disease, whether it's varices, as in hemorrhoids, or it's some of the angiodysplasias or AV malformations, and of course, a range of small bowel diseases, including Crohn's, going well beyond that of simply thinking about a malignancy. Now, in terms of management, there really is a classic management. Any patient with suspected upper GI bleeding typically gets endoscopy. It facilitates diagnosis and treatment in the vast majority of patients, high sensitivity and high specificity. You may need a NG to assess the rate of bleeding and for gastric lavage. A CT is typically not considered appropriate in patients with suspected upper GI bleeding. But that's not always the case, particularly if you're not really sure where the bleeding is coming from, or it both can be upper and lower, or in the cases where upper GI uh, evaluation is negative or if it's contraindicated. We talk about endoscopy, highly useful for upper GI bleeding, 98% sensitivity, 100% specificity in some series. And again, it allows you to treat bleeding in the majority of cases. Radiology uh, ha does have some role in upper GI bleeding only when endoscopy is not feasible or its results are inconclusive. Upper GI endoscopy may be contraindicated in the setting of shock, substantial comorbidities, or even massive hemorrhage. Adequate endoscopic evaluation of the bleeding source may not be possible when extensive luminal blood obscures visualization of the bleeding origin and um, when it's from a difficult location. So although CT or uh, any imaging modality is not the way to go in most cases, it still can be very valuable in select cases. Now I looked at the ACR appropriateness criteria. So let's just look at those quickly. Non-variceal upper GI bleeding, 
visceral angiography. So endoscopy reveals non-vericeal upper GI arterial bleeding source. They rate angiography, classic angio 9 first, and then CT second. If you have non-vericeal upper GI bleeding and endoscopy confirms the bleeding but does not have a clear source, then you see arteriography classic is a 9, but CTA is an 8. So CTA comes very, very close. You could see just simply doing CTA enterography or doing nuclear studies is just not going to cut it. When we talk about CTA, we talk about fast injection, thin slices, we talk about reconstructions, and we'll look at those things. If you have non variceal upper GI bleeding with negative endoscopy, then you see CT and arteriography really have about the same value, which really puts it favorable to CT since it's less invasive. If you have post-surgical traumatic causes of non variceal upper GI bleeding and endoscopy is contraindicated, then arteriography classic is just a bit higher rated than CTA, but again, it's pretty, pretty close and surely is going to be non-invasive. So let's look at some examples. This is a patient, you look at the stomach. Now, if you look at the image on your left, the stomach, the fluid is of increased density. Now, I will admit you need to be careful because certain medications like Maalox will make the stomach dense. And if you see really high density, you want to be careful before you start calling something a bleed, you better be certain. But then you look at the image on the right, you can see I've circled what appears to be a site of active bleeding, which is also very nicely shown to you on the MIP imaging. So you can see this patient has an active bleed, and the patient actually had an unsuspected carcinoma present. And there you can see as you go from arterial to venous, the vascular jet, very nicely seen of the patient's bleed. And there it is in 3D reconstructions. So a really nice example of active GI bleeding. You can see the blood in the stomach. You can see the source of bleeding. You can define the etiology. You can see the posterior gastric wall is indeed thickened. And then you see it through a couple different images. Another patient. Patient had GI bleeding. Patient has a history of H. pylori gastritis. And if you look at these images, there's thickening of the antrum and there's a high density zone present. That's a GI bleed. Very nicely shown. Again, doing reconstructions, coronal planes and 3Ds really is very helpful in this case. You could argue perhaps, could this be a tumor that's simply vascular? But when you looked at all of the images and you look at the arterial and venous, you recognize it was a source of bleeding. Uh, here it is again. Just a few more images showing you that. We talk about the importance of using the proper technique. So when we do CT, and I'll speak about this a little bit later, you never want to use positive contrast. You always want to use water. In this case, a nice example, there's some high density in the duodenum, which if you had positive contrast, you would say it's positive contrast. And in fact, your concern may be it is positive contrast. But when you look at the 3D MIP imaging, you can see the SMA, the celiac, portal vein, SMV. But look at the duodenum. Now you can see the entire duodenum has high density material within it. Here it is again very nicely shown. And what you're dealing with is active bleeding in the duodenum. Just a very nice example of that. And here's just another case in a patient with an LVAD high density in the duodenum, you see a blush, you see a bright dot, you always are concerned there could be something that's not a bleed, but typically what happens, we do dual phase imaging, and the appearance always changes between the arterial and venous phase. Usually it's more impressive on the venous, but the appearance is never the same. If the appearance is exactly the same on both phases, then to me it means that it's some foreign matter or something else within the patient's um, small bowel. And very nicely shown here, you can see the ulceration, you can see the active bleed, and 3D mapping, both MIP and volume rendering work very well. And here it is just another perspective showing that. So you can see again the importance of good injections, the importance of thin sections, and the importance of doing reconstructions, both with multiplanar and 3D imaging. This patient had GI bleeding. We weren't sure from where.
But look at the esophagus is dilated and look at the left posterior wall of the esophagus. There's bright structures there. That's the active site of bleeding. And here it is on the posterior gastric wall on the cinematic rendering. So we very nicely show this active bleed in the esophagus mid portion. Again, endoscopy is the study of choice for looking at the esophagus and stomach for upper GI bleeding, but CT can be very valuable, especially if the patient has contraindications. So that's upper GI bleeding. What about lower GI bleeding? Digital rectal exam and proctoscopy can be done initially to exclude anal rectal sources of bleeding. The main diagnostic options beyond this are colonoscopy. We could do tag red blood cell studies, classic angiography, video capsule endoscopy, and CTA. Now, a capsule endoscopy for a while was 100% positive, 100% sensitive, 100% specific. You get a lot of images, 50,000 images, and it was good, but we realize it's not as good as initially made out. It's useful in patients with GI bleeding, but you can still miss the cause of bleeding because of poor prep, rapid transit times, or just the presence of blood. And if you have an obstructing lesion, a mass, the capsule can become obstructed. So there's not much uh, you could do but literally do surgery to take the capsule out. And here's just a good example. This patient had a history of Merkel cell tumor. The patient has small bowel obstruction. You track it down. There's a large mass present. And then you see this bright structure with a star-like configuration. That is the patient's capsule. Now it's obstructed. There's no way to get it out. We would not have recommended doing capsule endoscopy. You want to get a biopsy, you can do peripheral biopsy, but you don't want to have obstruction. So now you have one of these endoscopic capsules that's obstructed. There it is nicely on the 3D. It's obstructed near the bladder, giving artifact. And here it is in the topogram. It looks like a Sputnik. And there it is in the left lower quadrant. So again, you want to be very careful. Many people will not do endoscopy until the patient's bowel has been looked at. If patient has strictures, patient has hernias, patient has other problems, you really don't want to be doing the capsule study or you can have these kind of problems. Now, Wells wrote an article, made the comment, detecting extraluminal disease in a bleeding patient may be helpful in influencing treatment and care, uh, such as when you detect a small bowel tumor, but it's also helpful in identifying complications, including hypoperfusion and signs and risk of organ disease exacerbation due to poor perfusion. So CT not only looks for the site of bleeding, but gives a lot of additional information Urgent CT is useful for determining the optimal timing of endoscopy. You don't want to necessarily do endoscopy now. Uh, you want to be able to do it when the study is positive and when potentially there's a chance for less complications. Now we talk about the rate of bleeding on colonoscopy was higher with extravasation on a positive CT than in those with a negative CT. So what this is trying to say is that if you have a patient with a negative CT and you do colonoscopy, the chance of you finding a source of bleeding is indeed small. If you do a patient with a positive CT, then it's greater than three times more likely you're going to be able to treat the bleeding. So more and more, people really realize that you don't want to do endoscopy or colonoscopy, typically colonoscopy, when you're going to have a negative exam. So it pays to make sure the CT is positive. Now, people for a long time have done nuclear medicine studies, and people did argue about nuclear studies. Perhaps we should do them. Uh, not that it's cheaper, but we could do them. It does have a high sensitivity for bleeding. It's not invasive, but it is problematic in many ways. One of the biggest things is it cannot accurately localize the site of bleeding because of poor spatial resolution and peristalsis and cannot define the cause of bleeding. CT defines the cause, be it a tumor, an ulceration, and the susception, but also explains how the bleeding is going on. One of the things to think about is that um, it also takes longer to do. Both CT and this is an old study, 2016, but the data was acquired about 2010 or so. Both studies were equally good for identifying bleeding, 
However, the site of bleeding was localized with CTA more frequently, and the average time to complete a nuclear study was three hours and CT one hour and 41 minutes. So CT is faster and localizes the bleed. That's important. Sometimes we say the patient has a bleed, we know exactly what vessel's involved. Then you do angiography, the bleed has stopped. Well, what you could do is you could still embolize if that's what's necessary. So again, very helpful from management perspective. There's an article impressed by Shu to compare CTA and tag red blood cell study as a function of time for, for those studies to be done in a patient with bleeding. And so they look specifically at what it takes to make these things happen. And um, it showed that in a clinical setting, CT reduces the time to angiography compared to, to nuke study. And this is most important in terms of patient management, but also makes the point that when you have a positive CT, the localization is so much better. Nukes, you can't do it. And we have many people, who, surgeons or angiographers who go in, they know what vessel the bleed should be coming from. They don't find the bleed, but they'll still embolize the vessel because they don't want to leave and then have the bleeding stop again. So in terms of management, it's very exciting how we can use this. A positive result at CT angiography is predictive of a positive result at subsequent uh, fluoroscopic angio. Sun found that amongst 26 patients with positive CTA who underwent uh, angiography, the fluoroscopic findings were positive in 85% of cases. And CTA, particularly compared to red blood cell, had similar capability in the prediction of positive fluoroscopic angiography, but did better in localization and localization becomes more and more critical. Now just some numbers, the upper GI bleed, proximal 70% of bleeding with a mortality of 10%, lower GI bleed distal, and up to 30% of cases of GI bleed, and a mortality just under 4%. So let's look a little bit more carefully at lower GI bleeding. Causes, diverticular disease number one, angiodysplasia, then hemorrhoids, ischemic colitis, other colitis, neoplasia, post-procedure like polypectomy, rectal ulcer, and some rare diseases. We talk about now the um, protocols, oral IV. Oral is always given, it's water. You give positive contrast, you're gonna do very poorly. You need to give in contrast injected, five cc's a second. We like dual phase acquisition, and we always look at things with multiplanar and 3D imaging. On our scanners, we like to use submillimeter thick sections, 0.75, and reconstruct them every 0.5 millimeters, and we do this in both arterial and venous phase imaging. We also talk about, and people have made this point, that people recommend non-contrast CTs, because if you see something of high density in the bowel, how do you know it's not foreign matter? Now, we don't do that. We do arterial and venous because we want, if we get two phases, to get two vascular phases because as I'll show you, bleeding sometimes is best seen in the venous phase. But one thing we know is if it's high-density material on the original study, that high-density material is still there. It's looking exactly the same, then it's foreign matter. So again, um, CTA works great. We do not do the non-contrast scans. There's an article we even mentioned way back when most investigators agree that it's useful to obtain a pre-contrast scan. But again, based on our information now, we do not. We only do contrast-enhanced scans. It saves on dose, and our accuracy is even better. I mentioned arterial and venous phase imaging. That's critical. We do both those phases. I mentioned the point about foreign matter. Here's something in the small bowel jejunum. It looks like a bleed or an ulceration. Well, you see it there, very nicely shown. And then you realize that uh, it doesn't change over time and it's simply a small bowel. Um, you thought about small bowel tumor, or vascular malformation, but it's exactly the same density, arterial and venous. And so it's simply some retained foreign matter. And I've seen retained foreign matter, particularly pills, simulate masses. So you need to be very, very careful in that regard. So in terms of analysis, axials, multiplanar, curved planar reconstructions, volume rendering, and MIP are all things that are very, very helpful.
This article by Kim using 64 slice CT, the diagnostic performance was not different amongst the arterial, portal, and combined set for detection and localization of GI bleeding. I think it can be helpful sometimes on the venous phase, you just don't see something, uh, that, or you didn't see it originally. In the venous phase, you pick it up, particularly in the recons. So again, if you're looking for maximum accuracy, both phases are important. Here was an article where they compared arterial and portal, and it equal to be about the same. But again, we find it to be helpful in that regard. Steiner, who's an angiographer, made the point that CTA is critical for determining who's bleeding, if they're still bleeding, and what you need to do about it, and that angiography is a valuable tool for the interventional radiologist, and for them, don't leave home without it is something uh, very much said. Now, we talk about bleeding, and we talk about why is CT so good. CT can detect 0.3 ml per minute of bleeding, and DSA nearly is twice that of 0.6. So for subtle bleeding, CT is going to be ideal. Now, let's talk a little bit more about lower GI bleeding, but I'm looking at my clock, and I seem to be running out of my 18 to 20 minute time zone. So let's take a break for a few minutes and come back, and we'll start again. Be right back. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctsus.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.